Hello and happy Pride. This Helsinki Pride Week, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you to Helsinki and the Nordic Culture Point and uh, the seminar with a quite long and hard topic, Norms and Attitudes Towards LGBTI Persons and Families in the Nordics. The topic is hard in many ways. Um, it's hard to pronounce and remember, but uh, it's also hard because of the current state of the world and the Nordics. If you want to participate through social media in this hybrid seminar, you can use the hashtags NRPOL, N-R-P-O-L, uh, Helsinki Pride and LGBTIQ. My name is Katarina Salo. Uh, I'm a Finnish-Swedish journalist and I'm going to guide you through this seminar today. Uh, me, myself, as a member of the queer community, I welcome this seminar with great pleasure. And as a mom to a two-year-old who has two mothers, I find it very important to talk about the family situation for the LGBTIQ community and especially for the children within the community. Similar events to this have been and will be organized in all of the Nordic countries. But without further ado, I welcome the Finnish Minister for Nordic Cooperation and Equality, Thomas Blomqvist, to officially open this seminar. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you. Their participants, it is a great honor for me to open this event. Indeed, I'm very happy that Helsinki Pride Week is taking place despite the odd circumstances in which we are right now. The COVID-19 crisis had, has underlined the importance of the work for human rights and equality. As we all know, uh, as we all know the LGBTI people have been among uh, the most vulnerable groups during the crisis. The insecurity and the isolation have affected everyone in the society, but especially people that are already in most vulnerable positions due to, the, due to discrimination or lack of social accep acceptance. In a way, the crisis has acted as a magnifying glass for struct structural inequalities in the society. I think we should take this as an opportunity to ident identify where we need to increase our efforts uh, for equality and resilience. Against this, events like this are especially important in reassuring that wor work for equality does continue on different arenas. I'm especially pleased that this event is organized by the Nordic Council of Ministers as this marks the f one of the first concrete steps of the work that we are taking for LGBTI equality in the Nordic cooperation. Last year, the Nordic Council of Ministers made a formal decision to include LGBTI equality to the framework uh, of the Nordic cooperation. This is a significant step and open opens up prospects of concrete cooperation at the Nordic level, both for public authorities and civil, soci civil society organizations. The Nordic LGBTI strategy uh, for the upcoming years will be launched at the end of the year. Finland will take over the presidency of the Nordic Councils of Ministers, ministers in January next year. This means that we will be in a key position to develop structures for the Nordic cooperation. During the year, we will focus uh, our efforts especially to combat harassment and violence experienced by LGBTI people. According to the survey done by the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, 32% of LGBTI people in Finland have experienced harassment during the last 12 months. This tells us that our society is not equally safe for everyone and it is a message that should be taken very seriously. Studies show that among the general population the attitudes have become more tolerant towards diversity of gender 
gender expression, and sexual orientation. At the same time, we must not take the positive development for granted. We must acknowledge the negative backlash of attitudes that can be seen all around Europe. Certain pol polarization of attitudes is happening in the society and it's, it affects especially people working for gender equality and for equal rights of the LGBTI people. There is a close link between attitudes and legislation in the society. Progressive legislation strengthens positive attitudes towards, towards diversity. In this context, I want to reassure that the government is committed to passing the new transgender legislation during the governmental period. What comes to other legislation, partial reform of the Non-Discrimination di Act will begin at the beginning of 2021. At the moment, an assessment of the Act is ongoing at the Ministry of Justice. Naturally, we want to make sure that the Non-Discrimination Act is an effective legal instrument for both victims of discrimination and for the promotion of non-discrimination. The Ministry of Social Affairs and Health is preparing to reform family leave. The reform will be implemented in such a way that treats everybody equally, including diverse families. The reform will be a major change in attitudes, as it will improve e equality between parents and make the lives of diverse families easier. The reform will support all kinds of families and ensure le equal leaves for children regardless of the form of the family. Sharing parent responsibilities in everyday life will become easier and the relationship between both parents and the child will be strengthened from the early childhood. Family leave reform takes into account the family concept of today and the flexibility needed by families. The reform is an opportunity to build a family leave she scheme in line with today's family concept. Even in terms of wording obsolete legislation will be brought to a modern level and its language will become gender neutral and suitable for all families. For example, the reform would give up gender tied daily allowance. Instead, both parents would receive an equal number of daily allowance days and equal flexibility in their use. Finally, I am extremely happy to be able to support the positive development that is happening at this very moment in Finland and other Nordic countries. I want to wish you fruitful discussions today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Minister Blomqvist, for these words. Uh, both the reform of the trans legislation and the family leave reform are extremely important political topics uh, in Finland at the moment and have been for a couple of years. Uh, I believe we are many who are hoping that this finally will happen. Thank you so much. During uh, this row of seminars, a uh, Norwegian journalist and a TV host Gisle Agledal is uh, going to function as a key listener. I'm sure that uh, Gisle himself is prepared to uh, tell us what a key listener is. Um, Mr. Uh, Agledal is also the host of the show Jevla Humu, uh, made for NRK, and I believe this is also shown on Yle in Finland. In the show he tries to understand why it is still so hard to be queer in Norway. After these seminars, uh, Mr. Agledal is going to make a report on what he has learned uh, from the different keynote speakers during the Nordics. So, uh, welcome, Gisle Agledal. I'm uh, sure you're going to tell us more about this. The airtime is yours. 
and happy, happy pride. pride. Is, is, can everyone hear me? I think there's something wrong on my part, but if you can see me, then I can talk to you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear anything. Yes, we are hearing you. Okay, okay thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm really sad I was able to physically come to see you and to celebrate Pride with you, but I'm happy to be here um, through the internet. Uh, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with knowledge. Take myself out. I... <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with the knowledge and the thoughts that you guys um, have about the topics today, which is really exciting. Um, but I want to tell you more about my part in being a key list and why I'm here. Um, I work as a journalist, and one of the most important areas to me is the issues regarding the LGBT community. A couple of years ago, I made this documentary that you just briefly mentioned. Um, and this series is about my struggle to. Um, feel proud and feel safe and at peace with my sexuality and my identity because it hasn't um, it hasn't always been that way for me. Uh, when I grew up, I uh, had this feeling that I was an outsider being a queer man. Uh, I grew up in a society which wasn't is still a very heteronormative. Uh, there was little to non-queer representation. Um, there was the occasional hate crime towards the LGBTQ plus people and so on. And, and that made me feel um, I was afraid to explore my sexual orientation. And essentially, it, it made me feel like there was something wrong with me. Uh, and that was the starting point of this documentary series where I delved into this large, uh, amazing, uh, complex queer world that I had been, um, I'd been like too afraid to approach it on my own. Um, and so I participated in everything from uh, the first gay marriage here in Norway in a church uh, to a sex uh, club um, or, or like in a sex party at a BDSM club here in Oslo and everything in between. Uh, and after like through meeting and learning from all these uh, wonderful people, like most, some of the most wonderful people I've ever met, some inside of them really changed. Um, so now, now that if someone has a problem with me or my sexuality, I, I truly know um, that that is their problem and not mine, uh, and that they are the ones that need to change. So after learning and, uh, and meeting all these people, I, I'm now like, proud to be queer and thankful for it, and, and I love to be a part of the LGBT. Uh, QIA plus community. But what makes me really sad and really angry is that we're, like, I know that not everyone feels that way. A lot of people do not feel safe. They do not feel like they have the, they do not have the space that needs, they need to safely explore their identities and um, be who they are supposed to be. And of course, like there's a lot of people that have other and more complex difficulties or challenges that I have faced. And I can only imagine the struggles to for people that are not, you know, if you have a double minority or if you have other issues that I have had. Uh, so we still have a very long way to go, and that is why we're here today. Um, as you was told, uh, this debate is an initiative from the Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, and in all of the Nord in all of the member countries and the areas, there will be a debate like this with a different topic. And my role as a key listener is um, that I will write down what you guys are saying, I will edit it, and I will recap it into a larger think piece that will be given to each of the ministers in these areas. And they will use um, your knowledge and your thoughts to figure out essentially what political change needs to happen next regarding the LGBTQIA plus in the Nordic region. Like, what can we learn from each other? Uh, what can we do better? And I, I'm really excited about this because I feel like a lot of times important topics are being discussed, but it sort of stays in the room, but not this time. Um, so what is being said here today will influence um, what the politicians are doing next. And that includes what is being said um, like from you guys in the audience as well. So please don't be shy to participate and speak what's on your mind. 
Uh, before we begin, I want to show you a short video clip from the documentary series. Um, it, it can be a little heavy to watch, but it, I think it really shows why it's crucial that we keep working towards change like we are doing here today. Um, the scene we're about to see is from a trip I took to Finnmark, which is the, the way up north in Norway in this little village um, called Karasjok, where I met this, uh, he was a Sápmi boy named Lemmet. And Lemet told me that uh, he is the only gay guy in Karashok where I met him. He says that there used to be more queer people there, like his big brother, for example, but the others, they, they're they not alive anymore. Okay, let's, let's see the video. Det här de lägger sig och glömmer sig ofta. Vad? Vad? Där du? Ja. Jag vet om vännerna hans vet att han är begravd. Vad sa du? Lasse sina vänner. Ja. Han har ju massor vänner i Oslo. Kom med dig. Om de i det hela tatt vet att han ligger begravd här uppe. För de fick inte en besked. Nej. Men Lasse Andre Risvik, min bror, han är en av de många homsen här som har tagit sälmord. Han var en drag queen från Karasjok. Vem var han? Vem var han? Han var en pratsom person. Han var sån partygirl. Älsket och feste. Men det kan jag ju skönna när man kommer från Karasjok. Jag är annorlunda sen andra kommer till Oslo och plötsligt passar man in. Men man kan ju inte säga att han passar in heller för han gjorde ju på en måte det heller. Han prövade att finna sig själv i Berlin och London och rest till olika städer för att finna sig själv. Men han, han fann det inte helt. Och man kan ju tänka sig om problemet ligger i att vara homo eller om problemet ligger i allt annat livet byr på. Men det är många homser som tar livet sitt här. Och min första förälskelse, han ligger också här. För min första kärsten. Och hur ska man tolka det? Vad ska man tänka? Vad ska man se? Um, and the thing is that not only was his big brother and his first boyfriend there, but but also his best friend. Um, so what we just saw was a cemetery full of young men. Um, and, and that is exactly why we're here today, uh, because what we just saw is unacceptable and, and we have to keep working for change in like every area here. Um, so uh, I'm going to start you off. Uh, I want to say that if, if there's anything you forgot to say or if you have any more information that you would like to provide for me, please don't hesitate to send me an email. Uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you guys have to say. I will be here and I will be listening and I will be taking a lot of notes. So good luck and, and thank you so much. Thank you, Gisle. We have some uh, technical problems here, but I hope you can see everything there on your end on the of the screen. screen. Um, I'm really looking forward to this um, report that Gisle is going to uh, write about these seminars. But now, uh, over to, uh, to the current state uh, for families in, uh, for, for rainbow families in the Nordics with a focus 
on thing how things look in Finland. I want to welcome Executive Director for the Finnish Rainbow Families Association, Juha Jämse. Welcome. Okay, thank you and um, greetings for everyone here and all around Nordic. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, Gisle. I've seen some of your documents in Finnish YLE. Uh, they are they are important documents. Uh, my I'm uh, uh, director of um, Rainbow Families Association, so my my. Uh, part here is to talk about uh, the families as defined families with children. Of course, we don't think that families are only families with children, but our aim in our work is families with, with children who have at least one LGBTI parent. Uh, I will make a few uh, like a uh, round of uh, mm, update on Finnish current legislation, but also uh, the the things that we are trying to uh, influence in the future so that the families in Finland, rainbow families in Finland would have better rights and also better services from the welfare s uh, system. But if we look at first uh, wh what is the status of re parents' relationships, what is the uh, possibilities for regis registering uh, the parents' uh, relationships in, in rainbow families. And uh, we had come a long way from registered partnership in 2002. We had some legislation for partial cohabitation, recognizing LGBT families also uh, since 2016, but the 2017 was the big year for for uh, us w uh, with equal marriage and also uh, same legislation uh, um, resulted in equal cohabitation recognition by of, of same-sex couples. And uh, this uh, development is of course quite recent compared to the rest of the uh, Nordic countries. But what still lies in future in this sphere of registering the parents of parents of the rainbow families. We have polyamorous relationships that are not uh, uh, recognized by legislation uh, almost at all. And all this is a very new uh, thing for many services and service sector uh, uh, professionals. Uh, but also, of course, there is a still a lot of uh, things how we can implement equal marriage in practice. Now it's equal in law, it's equal in many senses, but there is endless practical situations with all kinds of, because it's not only legislation, if it's about, uh, it's about um, uh, different uh, organizations own policies and it's about agreements between the workers and the uh, um, employers, unions, and there is many, uh, many still uh, details to take care of in this matter. But then another big uh, area of uh, rights is access to parenthood. What kind of access LGBTI people in Finland have uh, in connection with access to parenthood, with different ways how to achieve uh, family life with children? Uh, well, we must start with this uh, shocking uh, fact that sti Finland still requires uh, infertility for trans or non-binary people before uh, uh, gender reassignment treatments. So this is a this is a major, like medieval thing that is uh, fact in Finnish legislation. We really hope to get rid of it soon, as as the minister was also promising. Uh, the 
uh, assisted reproduction technologies or fertility treatments have been available in Finland for ra rainbow families ever since 1990s. There was law in 2007 that continued to assure that we still have the, ac the uh, female couples and uh, single women had access to it. And last year it was a great victory for us that finally the, the public clinics also started to treat uh, lesbian couples and single women because up until last year it was only the private clinics that were uh, treating uh, rainbow, rainbow families. Uh, joint adoption became a possibility in, in theory three years ago only. That is also has been much earlier in other Nordic countries. Uh, there has been, by f to our knowledge, there has been two adoptions uh, in rainbow families until now. I mean, it's three years in legislation, but now there's finally been two adoptions in reality. Though. So we see that adoptions will not be a big uh, share of uh, uh, fa rainbow families uh, ways of uh, becoming uh, parents. We also have uh, tried to influence foster care. I mean there hasn't been legal obstacles for LGBTI people work uh, acting as uh, foster parents but uh, there has been a lot of uh, l lack of information and uh, attitudinal problems and also uh, the, uh, the authorities haven't been uh, recruiting rainbow families actively for foster care, but that's that's developed now. But we have had a three-year uh, um, project trying to influence this. Uh, then there is some uh, improvement in the in the fertility counseling for trans and non-binary people before uh, they proceed to treatments. They should uh, receive. Uh, uh, good quality fertility counseling and also if they want to save their gametes before before treatments it should be possible for them and in Finland it's getting better we just made a r survey about how this works for our transgender parent community and the, this uh, this uh, survey showed that there is there is uh, improvement but there is still a lot to do with that but in the future, we are, uh, what we are still lacking in Finland is surrogacy. This is a big issue. The uh, current government has promised to look into this issue. The uh, minister didn't refer to this one. It's, I understand it's, it's a bit difficult for them as well. It, it is a complicated matter, but it has to be legislated because uh, at the current moment, when it's, there is no legislation, there is no support for for many services. So every part of the arrangements are uh, it not in safe uh, uh, are not safeguarded by the by the legislation. Then there is issues about uh, assisted reproductive uh, uh, assisted reproductive technologies in multi-parenting arrangements, and also we have still an issue with uh, uh, so uh, health uh, insurance compensations for private fertility treatments. But then the third big uh, sphere of rights for rainbow families is recognition of parenthood or custody. And in Finland, this joint custody has been possible for same-sex couples and also for mul multiple de facto parents since last millennium at least from the 90s. Uh, it, uh, there hasn't been uh, legislation denying that possibility for custody. But second parent adoption was only legislated in 2009 and last year it was another big huge gain. We uh, had maternity law uh, and which recognizes joint parenthood for uh, uh, female couples that have had the child through art art uh, assisted reproduction technologies. And also last year one major uh, new thing was a reform of the law on custody and this uh, reform now uh, made it possible for the first time for de facto parents uh, 
uh, not legal parents, but the de facto parents, the so parents who are uh, acting as actual parents in the lives of children, they now might have a visiting rights to the child, or the child has a visiting, visiting rights to the parents. It wasn't possible in Finland before, only with regard to legal parents. And what is it in the future? There is some. Uh, there should be legal parenthood for more, more than two parents. We have a lot of families, co-parenting families in Finland, uh, as I know that other Nordic countries has as well. And and we must move to forward to recognizing uh, legal parenthood for more than two parents. Uh, our government is uh, uh, making a reform of parental law as well, but uh, as to our knowledge, they are not including this issue or any other rainbow family related issues to the reform of parental law that minister didn't mention that either but it's in the uh, in the uh, ministry of justice at the moment and also parenthood should be registered as parenthood not as uh, fatherhood or motherhood or at least it should be uh, registered according to the confirmed uh, gender of the parent. There is still uh, a few other aspects. I don't. W I, I won't go into details with these. Parental benefits. There have been a lot of uh, improvements. There are still some things to gain. Uh, services for families. There's been, according to our survey, uh, improvement. But still, there is discrimination and also a lot of fear of discrimination. We had a good. Uh, uh, new is inclusive curricula for school and preschool a few years ago. Free movement is also an important issue for rainbow families. Uh, there should be joint recognition of civil documents within the European Union so that the member states would uh, recognize each other's uh, family documents. But then for last a few uh, uh, words about other Nordic countries or actually Finland compared to other Nordic countries. I don't have uh, full-fledged knowledge of, of uh, what is the uh, exact legal situation for rainbow families in other Nordic countries, but this is at least a few things to, uh, in comparison. Finland, as in all LGBT rights, is often one step behind other Nordic countries. We often come behind, but not far behind, but still f behind. Uh, we're the only country, obviously, in, in, in the Nordic, requiring sterilization of transgender and non-binary people. Mm. But then, in comparison to Nordic countries, we have had quite a good availabil availability of assisted reproductive technologies compared to other Nordic countries where it has been much more difficult in the past. Uh, our parental leave system is very rigid compared to the Nordic models. And we, this is very important, we never had an LGBTI action plan for the government. Uh, every other Nordic countries have had uh, a different kind of action, government and actual plan action plans. And l just last week, uh, Denmark, for example, uh, uh, announced a set of wide range of uh, reforms that they will do for LGBTI inclusiveness. In Finland, we it's one reform, it's one reform, but the government doesn't have any clear image what should be, do, be done on the uh, wide range. And at the moment, Sweden is the only country to recognize transgender parenthood. And our, all of us Nordic countries have these future challenges. Multiparent recognition, surrogacy, and also availability of adoption in practice. But I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Juha. Um, very uh, interesting and important issues. Um, and I'm sure uh, Gisle will take this into account to for, for his report and bring it to the ministers in the Nordics. Thank you, Juha. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Alexandra Sandbeck. She is an author, author and artist from Ostrobotnia who grew up with two mothers. 
Osterbotnia is uh, often referred to as the Bible Belt of Finland and uh, it's often thought that some parts of the coastal area are a bit conservative. So um, I'm super uh, excited to hear about how it was growing up in this area with parents uh, of the same sex. So uh, welcome Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you for having me. I'm here as a daughter of two mothers. And I guess I'm here to tell you that growing up in a rainbow family is completely normal and even wonderful. And it is. I'll say that right away. But my story and our family's story is still a bit different from the norm, whatever norm, and I want to do it justice. Actually, I want to do my mother ju justice. I'm here today because of her, to in a small way honor her. In my early childhood, I grew up in a quote-unquote normal family, in a small village on the west coast of Finland, mom, dad, and me. But all things considered, I grew up mainly with my mother, since my dad was absent a lot. And she was a great mother, and uh, we were always very close. When I was around 11, my mom and dad separated, and soon enough she told me about Lena, the love of her life. And within a year we have m had moved in with Lena and her daughter, my new stepsister, Anna, who is five years younger than me. Of course it was a bit rocky at first, mainly because I was so used to being just my mom and me. But I quickly realized that this was the family life I had been missing. And although we lived in quite a conservative small village, it was never a question of keeping their love or our family a secret. We became that stereotypical happy family with family dinners every night, family vacations, uh, open and deep conversations, and a lot of laughter and love. Me and my sister were never bullied in school because of our family. Uh, our friends got used to the situation quite quickly and it wasn't a big deal. Really, when it comes down to just the family life, we were happy, normal, and it was a safe harbor for my teenage angst. But stepping outside the family life, things weren't as normal. I guess it's not normal for any heterosexual couple to have to discuss whether or not to be open with their new family situation. I guess it's not normal to have to be brave just to live your life in a small countryside village. I guess it's not normal that within a year of your new family forming, you're on national TV talking about how damn normal you are. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were front runners, activists, and the first heroes of the gay rights movement. But I want to say there came a second wave in the 90s and 2000s of influential, brave, and open people leading the way towards equal right to marry and to adopt children. Among these people were my mothers. They taught me and the community around us that you do not hide love, you do not silence it, and it is indeed equal. They did a lot of firsts in our community, like register their partnership, and my mother opened the first Swedish-speaking office for SETA, the organization for LGBTI rights in Finland, in the very, very small town of Kronoby, because she saw a need. As soon as my moms came out, they started getting calls from people in need of support. And during my mom's few years at SETA, she helped hundreds of people. She gave them comfort, hope, and a voice. But it was during this time that the debate around us, or rather the SETA office, flared up the most. Now gays were going to take over the town and we had to save the children. It was saddening, but we tried our best to laugh at the ignorance. And the debate was rather interesting uh, in our community, since one of the biggest opponents of the SETA office was a local police officer and politician while one of the biggest defenders was the local priest. Things got turned all upside down in that small community when they had to face a brave new world. 
But in general, our family has had the most amazing support. It's been wonderful to see how my mom succeeded in spreading the love just by being open, honest, and free. In 2014, the first Pride Parade was held in Jakobstad, another small town on the west coast of Finland. We were all a bit involved in the planning, of course, and it was amazing to see thousands of people showing up to walk in the parade. My mom also received an award for her civil courage in the fight for LGBTI rights. Her thank you speech said plenty about her person. She said she'd rather not have received it, that she had done nothing special, just what everyone should do. But she hoped she had paved way for others, and she has. She passed away suddenly three years ago. It was a great loss to our family, of course, and I'm not okay with her death, and I'd do anything to have her back. But it was also a great loss to an entire community. After her death, I've heard wonderful things from people she helped. Some say they don't even know if they'd be alive today without her. In my own life, with my own fights to fight, I hope to be even a little bit as courageous and humble and strong as she was. So I'm here to honor her. Our family is great, and I grew up with a lot of love and support, and a lot of normalcy. But I also grew up looking up to two women, living lovingly, proud, and free. And I could not have had better role models. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much, Alexandra. This was um, very moving and inspirational. Thank you so much. When I contacted our next speaker to ask her how she would like to be presented, she said, I'm a normal working woman who happens to have a homosexual son. This is maybe the attitude that we need more of in changing the world towards a better place for sexual and gender minorities. I want to warmly welcome uh, Suad Taha, who is going to share what it's like to have a gay child who also belongs to another minority and what challenges that may have brought to her life. Welcome, Suad. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon. everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this seminar. I wish and I was hoping I had the opportunity to address uh, you face to face and enjoy uh, uh, Finland at the same time. I mean, first, I will introduce myself and my culture. Uh, my name is Saad Taha. I'm 59 years old, I'm married, I have uh, four children, lovely children. I work as a daycare for children. Uh, before uh, four years ago, I received two uh, prizes for my work as, uh, with, uh, as a volunteer with the Syrian um, refugee in Denmark. And last year, I received one pri a rainbow prize. Two years ago, I uh, bought, I, I wrote a book with my uh, son, Abdelaziz, who is gay, about my private li uh, life and the um, difficult conversation from war to homosexuality. And the book, uh, I have the book here, uh, From Lebanon to Lakivai. Yeah. And uh, the story, um, some tell me Aldri Haft, this book. Either I came to Denmark, uh, why I'm here? The, the reason for that, I have the pleasure to dress you today is to in, inspire people with the background or in the same situation as ours at handle what can be a difficult process. 
I came to Denmark 1984 from Lebanon as a refugee. It wasn't easy to my husband. I adopted Aziz to live in a foreign uh, country uh, with different language, uh, culture, religion. Uh, for example, it was strange for me. Maybe it's funny, but the different by uh, between the two cultures, it was uh, strange for me to see two people uh, kissing each other in the street in Lebanon. Wow, two kisses each other in the street. It is uh, it's too much. Or where the uh, the the dance. Um, it was amazed by uh, noticing uh, the dance enjoyed the uh, rarely uh, sunshine. In Hawaii, uh, when I got the opportunity to uh, study the Danish culture, culture later, I uh, was impressed about the way children have right to say their meaning to parents with respect and still friends. I mean, where I came from, the children have no right, right to, to say their opinion. Parents have always right, and they didn't, you know, they make never mistakes. I mean, the thing I have, I had an effect on me. I became much more open in accepting things that are different than me. No, I'm talking about Abdel Aziz, who is homosexual. I remember well the day when he when Abdel told us about his sexuality. He called us and said, "I wanted to tell uh, you something serious." With their, without his uh, uh, siblings, he came checking and asked us to sit down. I thought, okay, maybe he's sick or he had cancer. And he, say, he said, sit down, Mama and Baba. If you want me to marry a girl, I will not be happy and you will not be happy. And then he said, and, the, and he said to, to us, to, ma, to me and to uh, uh, my husband, he said to us, you and Baba taught us uh, not to lie to you. And then he said that he, uh, he is homosexual. Really, I didn't know. I said, yeah, okay. Really, I didn't know or had an idea about homosexuality. Or I had never, never in my life discussed what is what is homosexuality with my friend or my family or at school at university because it's a taboo i started by google i asked my husband my sister i have a sister in usa and she is very opening what is homosexuality I understood uh, that it wasn't a choice, not a disease. It was a gift from God to us and we appreciate it. Now I know much more about that than before. I have high accepted the fact that my son will never marry a girl and my picture of this life changed from one day to another. Man, but the hardest part of this was that Abdel was going through that alone for a long time without telling me about that. It was really, really hard for me. I cried alone for many weeks, for many days alone. 
I had the depression. I wasn't happy for a few, few weeks. I have nobody to tell why. And because it's a taboo, I can't say to someone why I am angry or not happy. And who know me, I'm a happy girl. I like to dance, to hear music, but I didn't. And so I said to myself, Saad, what do you want? I said to myself, I want Abdelaziz. I want he is everything in my life. And I said, you are strong. You are the mom who take care that we have, we will, and I insisted that we will handle this by solidarity, by love. And I said to myself, uh, if it was, if we are strong, nobody can break us. At this time, we were offered to uh, participate in a documentary about our family. And the idea was to offer an alternative vision to the Danish people about refugee in Denmark. Uh, th this documentary, which shows another side of refu uh, refugee uh, family, as normal as the Danish family. And in this documentary, Abdel told the Danish people about his sexuality. And I said this this evening, now it is public and everybody know it. It's not a secret more. And the storm was on its way towards us. Next day, there were a woman who called me and said, who called me and said, you must uh, distant from your son. You must disassociate your, your son and people gossip about you. I said for her, how you are a mother and you said to me, you must distance from my son. He's my blood, he's my flesh. How dare you say it? It was hard because there, are, there were many people, positive response from many people who called me and said, we are proud of Abdelaziz. And I, you know, I want to say Abdelaziz, he is a journalist in the Danish uh, TV and TV2 uh, channel who make uh, now uh, a, prog a program. There were, ma there were many response positive response from many families who had uh, a sister or a daughter from uh, Muslims, Christian, Jews. Uh, I helped many families to contact with each other. And it was a, a Muslim, a Mua, who was very, very uh, afraid. And she asked me, so why you are strong? I said to her, because I take LDH, uh, or, uh, um, I don't care about the people. I care about my son. And I know this uh, is a gift from my God to us. And after three weeks, this mother be, be uh, uh, connected her her uh, daughter, and now they are go good friends. I want, Eva, to I, I, I want to 
to say to all parents an advice from me. Try to embrace your children. Try to give them time to talk about their worries. They didn't choose a, a they didn't choose it. They didn't choose it. They are alone. Uh, don't exclude them from uh, the society because they are minority in the some in the in society. Try to be good friend to them, to hear them, to give them loves because they are alone, so they didn't choose it. And from God, it's a, it's, it's a present, it's a gift. We should go, uh, take it and protect, protect them, not to say you are not my, my, my son or my sister or one from the family or neighbors. Don't exclude them. From the society, instead for give them love, listen to them. I mean, what I have learned from this situation, I learned difficult times make us more strong or stronger. New ways of lives, life make you more open. And to see my my children happy and fulfilling dreams are good gift to me and i thank all of you to hear me uh, to uh, in this seminar thank you very much thank you so much um, that was also very, very moving and many of uh, the queer people have had difficulties with coming out to their parents. So uh, I myself am, am super innerly happy uh, that there are parents who fight for their queer children, like Suad told us now. Thank you so much. Uh, next up, we have uh, our last speaker before we're going to go over to the panel discussion in a moment. Uh, she's a great friend and a long-term long activist who has worked her whole career to make Finland a better place for all kinds of families. Please welcome Anna Moring, PhD and senior advisor from the Network of Family Diversity to tell us about how we can make the Nordics a better place for all kinds of families. Welcome, Anna. Thank you. This, um, this topic is so small and precise. Um, I love it. Um, so how to make Nordics a better place for all kinds of families? We've been talking about LGBTI plus uh, things today. Uh, and my own perspective comes from uh, from a, a bit of wider take on diversity. Uh, but these issues are very familiar in my work as well. Um, I come from the network of family diversity. We're a network of 10 different organizations, all representing families that are somehow diverging from what we call the norm. And, uh, and many of the issues that consider concern rainbow families, concern same-sex families, concern uh, other LGBTIQ people, also concern other forms of diverse families. And I think we have a great opportunity for cooperation in these, uh, in, in, in these situations. In Finland, for example, uh, we have counted that approximately one third of all families are somehow divergent from the norm. And that, is, uh, that number is an understatement, but the statistics are so uh, diffuse that we don't dare to say more than one third. But for example, in Finland, 22% uh, of all families are single parent families and that makes uh, also almost 20% of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, 
parents who don't live with their wi- with their children because for every every single parent family officially there is a, there is another parent who officially doesn't live with the child uh 9% of all families are step families uh bicultural or immigrant f- immigrant families form up to 8% of all finnish families and uh, for example circa um Twenty percent of all couples who wish to have children face some sort of infer- in involuntary infertility. That's a difficult word. Um, but uh, if when we talk about fertility treatments for uh, for same-sex couples, it is a part of a larger problem, which is fertility treatments for uh, all sorts of people uh, and the availability of treatments in. Uh, in Finland and the availability of treatments in the public sector and the avali- availability of treatments in in the private sector as well. So many many of these issues actually concern uh, a variety of different families. Also, we must remember that there are uh, different uh, situations also in the rainbow families. Not all rainbow families are uh, two moms and their children and uh, living happily ever after but there are divorces in rainbow families there are step families in rainbow families as we just heard rainbow families uh, also lose their partners their parents uh, their their children to disease or death and uh, and these situations of course as affect people in every sort of possible family formation so with this introduction uh, the nordic countries um need a family policy that actually takes into account many different sorts of of diverse families and that sort of policy is going to be very good also for rainbow families and also for lgbtiq people um of course regarding the specific issues of lgbtiq plus people as well so um but but um, when when you look at the situation in the nordic countries now um i would say in a in a global perspective of course we are in a pretty good position we have a high standard of equality we are we, we believe very strongly that um, everyone should be equal and uh and we have a sort of non discrimination policy in in place in in all of the nordic countries uh we have family policies and family services that recognize family diversity widely um we have uh, a situation where uh, for example practices for practices for combining work and child care are quite uh, um inclusive already um of course you could always do better but uh, but in a general in a general that's, that's quite okay um and uh, what i think it's important specifically in a nordic context uh we have this nice um competitive relationship to each other you have said that finland is always a step behind or 10 steps behind when we were fighting for the law for uh, registered partnerships in the beginning of uh, the 20th uh, 20th century uh, we were talking about being 15 years behind sweden uh, and uh, and and basically uh, b- basically that gives us fuel and uh, uh that what has surprised me when i've been traveling in in the nordic countries and talking about these issues is that finland is actually quite progressive in many in many issues so uh, we have moved to a, a situation where finland is actually going uh, t- take it taking ahead of the rest of the nordic countries so you guys there in norway and denmark you need to uh, work on your uh, wor- work on your game and sweden as well for example this uh, possibility to have custody for more than two parents is not a possibility in in Sweden I don't know about Norway and Denmark in that sense but uh, but but we have practices that are actually better than uh, than other countries and this sort of competition and also uh learning from each other is giving us a very good uh sort of combination of uh, of progressive uh, practices that can be sort of uh, tried out in quite similar systems and then uh, easily implemented into other other countries so i hope that this series of seminars that you are organizing is going to be one start starting point to a even stronger competition um there are however some challenges in the uh, nordic system and uh, and in the nordic thought of equality for example um uh, we have a belief that uh, 
uh, equality means that everyone should have the same possibilities. But that might actually mean that some uh, have less possibilities. If you believe that uh, every child should have two parents, uh, which is of course equal for the children, uh, then you are actually m limiting the scope of, uh, of parenthood um, to either uh, to, to exclude both um, children that have uh, one parent, but also children who have two, three, no, three, four, or five parents. So, so uh, what is good for one child is not necessarily the best for all children. Um, we have a strong belief in uh, non discrimination, but uh, on the other hand, we might, in some situations, fail to account for, for example, racist or homophobic practices uh, when we sort of uh, go behind the thought that we are already equal, we already have this anti-discrimination laws in place, we don't have these practices. It might be more difficult for us to actually pin down the situations where discrimination happens. Uh, and, and those situations are those which we need to find and do something too. And that might be hard in a, situ in, in, in a system that, that believes very strongly in legal, legal equality. Um, and of course our legislation is uh, in many ways still taking the norm as a starting point. So uh, our families uh, are uh, required to assimilate to a legal system which isn't suitable for them, which is built for some other sort of families and then uh, uh, then if you are diverging in some way uh, you need to sort of find the way to claim equality instead of claiming what you actually need. So for example rainbow families have been forced to claim uh, adoption for two parents uh, and not claim for example uh, adoption for all parents that de facto are in the life of the child as you have you ha just said. So we have uh, uh, we have perhaps um, a situation where we need to start looking beyond equality toward uh, uh, recognizing the fact that families might actually need laws that give us more rights than the normal would uh, sort of assume. Um, so how then do we make Nordics a better place for all diverse families? I think uh, the essential um, uh, points are, uh, first of all, positive attitude. I think that um, what makes families thrive in any country, in any society at all, is when they are met with positive attitudes. When you can tell a family, when you can look at a family and be like, hey, yay, there's a family, that's a good thing. Woohoo, families are great. Um, we need positive attitudes toward diversity, we need positive attitudes toward families in general. We need a family family policy that uh, actually takes into as its starting point the thought that family is a good thing, not that family is problematic and needs to be addressed in these and those and those ways. And we need positive attitudes towards children. Uh, we need that. We need every child to be met as a un unique, wonderful person, regardless of what kind of family uh, it lives in. The second thing we need is uh, equal politics, but also specific solutions for diverse families. We need legislation that goes in the direction that you had just pointed out, uh, with recognition for more than two parents, uh, with uh, eliminating these uh, catastrophic transphobic uh, sterilization things, with uh, recognizing all sorts of families in all sorts of situations in the most uh, most um, recognizing way that we can find uh, and not taking taking the norm of two parents and living uh, jo jointly in the same house as, as a starting point. And third, we need support and security for all, for all kinds of families in all sorts of situations. So we need the services and the law to recognize all the family situations and support them in an equal manner. And then we have the Nordics as uh, a whole that would be the, like, the best possible place in the world for all sorts of families to live. That's what I hope for in the future. Thank you.
Thank you, Anna. Um, it was quite clear <laughs> what we should do. Um, and uh, uh, I'm now going to slip over here, and we're going to have a panel discussion about these things. Uh, I want to continue on this that you said, uh, Anna, about the, the, the positive, positive attitude. attitude. Okay, let me, okay, let me put it off my microphone. Okay. Uh, about the, the, the positive attitude, because it sounds so... Um, how, how should I say? It's, it sounds too easy. But, uh, the, the, I mean, what, what's, what's it going to take? Like, attitudes or legislation? What comes first? And how can we work with these things? How can we get a positive attitude towards families? Am I using this mic or am I, are we mic'd? We're mic'd in this one. Very good. So. Then I don't, don't cause any trouble with, with the other mics. Um, yeah, that's a very, very, very good question. I think that attitudes and legislation are sort of uh, uh, taking steps like with each other. Um, in, in Finland, we have a strong belief in law. So you saw clearly that you saw clear change when, for example, the law of registered partnerships was passed. The attitudes toward gay people changed overnight. Uh, and, and of course, you needed some sort of attitude change before that happened. Uh, but, uh, but the legal process was definitely a sort of a massive uh, uh, boost to that attitude change. And, and the same applies for all other, all, all other family legislation. Uh, when you legislate, you first need some sort of attitude change and then you get the boost of the legislation and then the attitudes change even more when, when the new thing, new, new system becomes a norm. And that's what I'm hoping uh, from the parental leaves reform that, that both Minister Blomqvist and, and, and Juha were referring to. Uh, that, that, uh, that when we get a system that is more like the Swedish system, actually, there Sweden again is a bit <laughs> ahead of us, uh, we would also experience a change in attitudes uh, also toward equal parenthood. So step by step, new kids on the block. Yes, it's the, that is the process, and uh, uh, also le legislation changes in Finland. They have an effect, but we also before we can take that step, we have to uh, grow momentum for the reform. I mean, there has to be for some kind of cultural change and demand for new kind of legislation. This is what we're trying to build with uh, multi-parenting. Uh, rights at the moment. There is not enough uh, social awareness that it is actually in the child's best interest that she, he or she will have all his parents recognized, even if it's three or four parents. There is not societal understanding of this yet. So that's why it's still so hard for us to push for the legislation. And what can we do <laughs> to, to, to go there? I mean, it's it, it feels like when, when you are in the community and you want change, it feels like you want to go so fast, but it moves so slowly. Can we, can we speed it up? I like this uh, collaboration idea that we, we, have to, we, we have to compete with the other Nordic countries. What, what, what could, we, could we do there? Anna? Um, yeah, I, I, I think that um, uh, collaboration with the other Nordic countries is, is important. We have uh, witnessed in the rainbow com community as, at, at least several issues where, where uh, we can say, hey, this is enforced in Sweden, we can do it in Finland as well. And I think that Swedes uh, can now do the same with Finland in case of these, of these custody things, for example. But also collaboration with different uh, uh, other groups of uh, discriminated people, of, of diverse families and so on. Uh, our network of di diverse families is, is unique in the, in, in the Nordics. I've been uh, introducing that in, in Sweden for some of the people who work there with different, different families. But, uh, but, but I think these kinds of, um, of larger networks can build you more momentum to the changes. When you can say that, for example, a three-parent situation uh, exists for uh, besides rainbow families, also in uh, step families and in uh, families where you have uh, child children who have been taken into custody and, and placed into families, so foster families. Uh, in these situations, um, it's always more powerful to 
uh, make changes in society when you can combine different groups and, and thus gain a greater sort of uh, uh, force to, to argument for your, for, for your needs. And there is only so much that we, we as lobbyists can mm. do. I mean, advocates for, I mean, we can argument our mm, so much, so much. But if there are not stories from people, mm. it will not move. I mean, this this change in society and culture, it, it requires stories. Stories mm. like Alexandra and so so has been telling us, mm. and this is the. The stories of people is the true engine of change. Mm -hmm. Then we come and try to formulate it somehow. What kind of legislation might meet that demand? But we have to show the demand uh, through stories. Uh, I want to ask you, Alexandra, have you seen uh, or I'll rephrase that? What kind of attitude changes have you seen um, towards your family if you look at? like the early or mid 90s to this day now? Um, I think I've lived in a bubble of love. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm sure there has been changes um, as you can see it like through the, the pride in Jakobstad and things happening, um, but towards us, the attitudes were good and in some cases where they weren't, uh, me and Anna didn't have to see that, so we were protected. Um, but I'm sure things have gotten better, but I'm, I was fortunate. I've had positive attitudes mostly all the way. I love hearing that. And I think it's it's super important to also hear these uh, positive stories so we don't just have the, the negative ones. But um, what about you, Saud? Have you uh, noticed changes in how you or your son uh, has been met with attitudes in Denmark? Uh, I'm sorry, Saud, we're having some uh, technical problems and we cannot hear what you're saying. I'm sorry, sorry. did it go up? Yes, now we can hear you. Thank you. Okay, we are three mo mothers now. Uh, from, from uh, different countries, we are cooperate from uh, with each other to help the families because many families have no idea about homosexuality. For example, they uh, they uh, thought you know, they think that at homosexuality is a disease or a choice. So uh, so we are. Um, some we uh, we are giving uh, them uh, knowledge homosexuality it's not a disease or a choice and it really it, it works in many families and they are afraid what people talk about then here uh, rumors when we take this uh, gossips and uh, the rumors from each other it it helps so we are we are three ladies and we are helping uh, the others family in the uh, ghetto. Thank you. Uh, what do do you Anna and Juha, Do you know what, what the situation in Finland is with like uh, double minorities? If you have a, a 
sexual minority and uh, are uh, not uh, a Finnish native? Well, I could say first from the uh, LGBTI parents' perspective mm -hmm. and rainbow families' perspective that uh, with us, within our membership, it's still not, it's not a visible thing. I mean, we are trying to reach out, of course, for all, all people, but also it might be so that at the moment it requires some kind of privilege to be able to raise a family as a LGBTI person in Finland. It also shows in the, for example, in the socioeconomical status of rainbow, parents of rainbow families. So our dream is that in the future, every LGBTI person has a real chance of choosing if they want to raise a family with children or not. But at the moment, it seems that it's not still available for economical issue reasons, but also, I'm sure, for cultural reasons as well. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with, with you, Hav. Uh, we, have a, we have a situation where uh, LGBT IQ plus people who have children uh, need to know the system quite well and they need to sort of uh, believe in their possibilities and believe in their uh, sort of uh, chances and, and uh, know the ways to how, how to form families. And, and that is an agency that many double minorities probably lack uh, for, for one reason or another. And, and I hope that we can work toward a Finland where that would be possible and toward Nordics where, where everyone would have the possibility to have a family if they want to. Um, I know that, uh, that uh, the Helsinki Pride community, uh, Helsinki Pride Yhteisö as an organization works a lot with, uh, with for example, ref refugees who are LGBTIQ uh, or, or, or so on. And, and they, uh, they have... Uh, um, Groups, groups, and support for these for these people, uh, and also provide possibilities for uh, for engaging in community uh, actions. But uh, uh, but that is also quite small scale. Um, so mm -hmm. we we lack a we lack even information on how much we have people who have a, a, an immigrant background or a refugee back, background uh, who who belong to sexual or gender minorities. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I find it also that, that it, it becomes uh, it, to get to have children as an LGBTIQ couple. It also becomes a class, a question of class. So you uh, need even more intersexuality, uh, so so you can you can work with this stuff. But what, what does the future hold for us in in the Nordic uh, queer communities? What, what what changes can we see in that? coming 10 years or so? Well, at least one promising uh, if, uh, change would be that the Nordic LGBTI organization would uh, work more in, uh, uh, in cooper cooperation. And Nordic uh, Council of Ministers last, uh, oh no, in the beginning of this year arranged a meeting in uh, Copenhagen where all of the uh, Nordic LGBT organizations had a chance to gather together, and we, uh, we in the associations, Nordic associations, are really looking forward to Nordic Council to facilitate facilitate our cooperation also in the in the future. And this this is uh, a plan. I I understand that it's it's part of uh, Nordic Council's uh, action plan for LGBT issues. I, I think that uh, uh, we're going to see. Um, I, I hope to see this this nice uh, competition continue uh, between the Nordic countries because we are at our best when we try to beat Sweden. Uh, Swedes are at, at their best when they try to beat the Norwegians, at least in football, in, in, in ice hockey. It's us they want to go against. But uh, but but I, w I want to see this competition go on and and this sort of learning from each other and also referring to each other. And, and as you have said, the, co the cooperation. And I would actually, uh, in, in my dreams, I see a network of uh, diverse families in all the Nordic countries that would sort of uh, g gather all of these uh, different issues and, and put them together and, and see what we could do to achieve uh, uh, wide legal and societal recognition for, for a very wide diversity. 
Uh, what about you, Saud? What, what are the most pressing issues uh, in Denmark at the moment? At the moment, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, many p people needed to see uh, uh, someone talked open, uh, openly about being a parent to homosexual. Uh, in that way, people got uh, confronted uh, with this and had to talk about it. Uh, like me, for example, um, uh, my friend have us uh, have a little scam, and she said to me, "Because you are talking about it in public, now I dare." Uh, to say uh, my my uh, my daughter is ho homosexual, I think it is it's coming in few few uh, years. It it is more positive now uh, than before. Hmm. And Alexandra, you can now you're uh, our speaker for the the coastal Ostrobotnia <laughs> region of Finland. Uh, what? What's the issues there at this moment? Uh, I'm afraid the issues seem to be sort of the same. That it's ignorance, um, and since my experience is in those small communi communities, the things I've seen work um, are being open and honest and um, acting like my mom's dead, completely normal. <laughs> so um, I think um, knowledge and uh, openness will help guide the way. Uh, I think that's actually kind of a good point to uh, end this panel with openness <laughs> and knowledge. And I hope that that is something that we can achieve together and in competition with the other Nordic countries. I'm going to step over there for a while and try to sum up this uh, this seminar a bit. Let's see. Uh -huh. Okay. So um, uh, it's been uh, quite a lot of stuff in one and a half hours and. Uh, super super interesting um, combination of uh, legislation and uh, uh, and and this societal stuff and then also the attitudes and the the feelings and and uh, uh, the the private stories uh, and what I take with me from this is that we need uh, more collaboration and that attitudes and legislation go hand in hand and we need them both uh, to proceed to get a better a better place for us and for our children uh, to living and we need acceptance and knowledge and of course to get get all of this we also need resources so uh, this is where I hope that uh, Gisle can take uh, all this information and pack it up and send it to our, our ministers and tell them what we actually need in this society to be able to function and go about our daily lives. But Thank you so much for uh, following this hybrid seminar. Thank you to all our keynote speakers here and in Denmark and in Norway and to our live audience. Um, and please uh, follow the Nordic Council of Ministers on Facebook and Instagram for more Nordic news and seminars. And I also want to wish everyone a happy Helsinki Pride Week and remember both the fight and the celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you.